And now we'll hear from, hear from uh, Brett Kugelmass. Uh. Firstly, thank you everyone for coming here to learn. I know this topic can be really hard to wrap your mind around. One of the things that always confused me was the question of how can anything solve the climate change problem if every solution still has a carbon footprint? And everything does have a carbon footprint. Every product in the world that we make at scale foundationally requires chemicals and energy that come from fossil fuels. Solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, electric cars, you need fossil fuels to make them. So don't they all just still make the problem worse, just less fast? I was so troubled by this paradox that I left my life in Silicon Valley to move to DC to start a research center to explore this very question. If everything makes the problem worse, just at different rates, how can we ever fix the problem? How can we reverse climate change rather than just attempt to slow down the inevitable? Every system with a positive carbon footprint can at most replace a worse energy source, but they never actually subtract from the carbon damage that we've already done. If we combined every one of these solutions, renewables, efficiency, electric vehicles, and a hundred more that we just learned about, the best we could ever do by definition is still just add a little bit of carbon every year, which means the best that we can do is still make the problem worse and worse every year. Here's an analogy. Let's say we're in a car and we want to go to Florida, but instead we're heading to Canada at 60 miles an hour. Even if we stop accelerating, the equivalent of eliminating all emissions globally in every sector, transportation, heat, electricity, agriculture, industry, the carbon that we've already put in the air means we're still going in the wrong direction at 60 miles per hour. And all we're doing is preventing going in the wrong direction at 61 miles an hour. The car doesn't actually get turned around until we remove the thousand gigatons of CO2 that we've put in the air over the last couple hundred years. And even then, we have to make up for all the miles lost. According to the laws of mathematics, all of our solutions that merely replace without subtracting can only reduce what we were going to emit. They don't remove what we've already emitted. And what we've already emitted is what's causing climate change. All of our solutions combined max out at offsetting 20 gigatons of new carbon dioxide. But we've already added 1,000. So all the solutions combined, everything we've heard so far, can only address 2% of next year's problem and 0% of the greenhouse that we've already built that will continue to bake the planet year over year. So that's mathematics. But here's one from physics. When you use the energy inside of an atom, it is a million times more powerful than burning fossil fuels. That incredible power is probably the reason we are so wary of it now. We're scared of weapons, we're scared of waste, we're scared of radiation. But if we are going to tackle climate change, a problem a thousand times harder than anything we've ever encountered before, it'd sure be nice to have a tool a million times more powerful. When I first dipped my toes into this quandary, I thought those are the three problems to solve. Weapons, waste, and radiation. But what I found was that the 100 light water nuclear reactors already in our country that happen to provide 60% of our clean energy, in fact, already solved those three problems. They can't be used for weapons. The waste has never hurt a single person, place, or thing in all of human history. And the radiation, even in a meltdown, is so inconsequential that in the last three meltdowns, not a single person died. I understand these claims can seem 
unbelievable, since the organizations that I trust imply the very opposite with their actions, telling a story of disproportionate risk. The United Nations inspects light water reactors, implying they could make bombs. The government regulates waste for millions of years, implying that it's far more hazardous than other types of waste that we don't regulate at all. Medical standards bodies still declare that no matter how little radiation you receive, it is statistically life-threatening, even after they proved that wasn't true. Despite those implications coming from otherwise trustworthy institutions, through their actions, they engender fear that paralyzes our ability to deploy this incredible tool. So anytime someone says, I don't believe the experts about the severity of climate change, I actually now cut them a little bit of slack. They're not right. But I can respect questioning conventional wisdom. Now, if we all agree that nuclear is awesome in its powers, we still have a lot of work ahead of us. We would need the equivalent of 10,000 of the largest nuclear reactors ever built hooked up to just as many machines pulling carbon from the air. In the Q&A, we can dive a little bit deeper into other remaining challenges, but if you were to take away one thing from this talk, it is that we can't solve climate change without undoing a hundred years of previous energy emissions, and that will take an energy far more powerful than what created the problem to begin with. Thank you. There's been a lot of pushback over the last decade and years over issues of equity or issues of economic burden that fall on various parts of the country. Uh, and that has been a very negative uh, pushback. You talked about if we're going to have prosperity, we need climate. You talked about what you folks are doing in Puerto Rico. And I just wanted to bring out a little bit more about the positive side, and, and Tom, you had some of that as well, of what this can mean in a positive economic way and anything you folks are involved in that relate to a fairer equity of the, the, not just the burden, but actually the change in society. I'll jump in one quick point. As I said earlier about the fastest growing professions, wind and solar in both industries are working to reach out to diverse communities that have often been left behind or have not been aware of the opportunity so whether I know uh, my good colleague Abby Hopper at SIA is reaching, making sure that those solar developers are reaching into underserved communities to create opportunities to draw those individuals into the solar field. We're reaching out, yes, to those, also to the veterans community, different point. We're also reaching out to those communities that um, have historically been legacy coal, whether it's miners or, or coal plants nearby, to draw those people in so that they can see the upside economic job opportunity of clean energy and not leave those individuals and communities behind. You know, I think something that doesn't get brought up enough is air pollution. Uh, air pollution I mean, kills millions and millions across the globe every year. It might be, you know, in some <clears throat> regards, just as big a problem as climate change. And it also disproportionately affects the poor. So I think the faster that we can replace the dirty energy sources with new energy sources, uh, the faster we'll be helping these uh, disadvantaged communities, yeah. No, that's one of the, what economists call the co-benefits of taking action on mm -hmm. carbon is you're often taking action on the other uh, sources. And uh, well, let's go to that you said, uh, uh, you sort of raised the time scale. This is a tough problem, but I, I just wanted to get a sense of uh, how much growth you might expect in this decade. I mean, solar and, and uh, wind have done magnificent uh, as a percentage increase, but the truth is they still remain a very small part mm -hmm. of the electric generation. And so I'm just trying to get a, uh, in different technologies, just a sense of um, what we might expect in the next decade or whether we're looking, especially Brett, on the advanced nuclear 
two, two decades or three yep. decades. One of the sources that we found um, to help us with our net zero energy renovation was actually from the sewer. And rather than using traditional geothermal wells, we're actually using the ambient heat that's in the sewer fluids uh, through a sewer heat exchanger that's been done in Europe in many places and also in Canada. So for this particular system, there's other manufacturers. We're the first um, organization to deploy it in the United States. But DC Water was so fascinated by it that now they've put it into their new facility. Um, and they actually see it as a way for the municipality to actually perhaps create some economic benefit uh, for that source. So this is a sewer from 1890s right outside Florida Avenue. Major sewer <laughs> could, pr could produce a lot of extra energy for lots of different facilities. So I know nuclear, solar, wind have to be part of this, but there's also sources right there that's already in our existing infrastructure that can be captured and used um, if you don't have the ability to do geothermal wells or perhaps wind or solar is not enough for where you are. I don't know, this question of timeline, you know, people talk about what we can prevent by the end of the century. I mean, we're looking at hundreds of millions of people being displaced in the next couple decades. Hundreds of millions of people in drought from civil conflict. I mean, we only have a couple decades to solve this problem. And then the fundamental issue is we're not going to throw away the tens of trillions of dollars of cars and factories that we've already built and that we're paying off for the next 40 years. We're not going to throw all that away and build new stuff in the next 20 years. So unless we figure out a way to remove carbon from the air using existing infrastructure, this is never going to happen in 20 years. And the only way to do that is to make carbon negative fuels, is actually to make the thing that we hate so much, the, the gasoline. We have to make that from the air instead of from the ground. And I claim that the only way to do that in the quantities that we need to remove those thousand gigatons of CO2 that we put in the air for 100 years is using something a million times as powerful. So we need to be deploying nuclear at a scale that you've never even imagined within just the next 10 years to address this problem. Uh, Brad, I think, uh, I mean, I hear a number of advocates that are focused on trying to use what we call more advanced nuclear technologies that are generally more efficient, safer, uh, uh, have more safety features. And the question kind of is, is how soon might those technologies actually be available in the marketplace? My impression is there's a lot of R&D, and by the way, the Congress passed by voice vote, no conflict at all, uh, stepping up some of the energy research on these advanced technologies. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, listen, some of the technologies that I'm seeing coming down the pipeline look amazing, but they are far down the pipeline. We've gotten away from the conversation of what we already built in the 70s. The nuclear reactors that we built back then, I mean, they're amazing. And they're the cheapest source of energy that we've got. Um, so, you know, I would start by focusing on how do we take what we already built and using modern construction technology to just build it cheaper and faster um, and in a period of far lower interest rates, <laughs> uh, then focusing too much on the advanced technology coming down the pipeline. Once you've got a thriving nuclear industry, those advanced technologies will come out of the R&D budgets of uh, these giant companies that are yet to come but we need to start deploying the technology that we already have. Well, we're, we're literally out of time, and uh, I just wanted to indicate we, we often hear in these conversations, as we already have, about the American moonshot when we went to the moon, uh, <laughs> that that's the kind of drive we need to do. Now, there's a fundamental difference between that and the challenge we face on climate. Most of us could only watch on television with what was happening on going to the moon. We could not be participants in that because we were not high-end scientists and engineers and courageous astronauts. A uh, very limited number. But this issue is one, as Frank Loy, uh, one of my mentors in life, uh, has pointed out over and over, and, and what Bob mentioned today, is something 
all of us participate in. We all add to the, the problem. We can all help be solve the problem, uh, we, whether it's as an cons individual consumer, uh, as an activist in the political arena, or whether it's as an educator or a preacher, or whether it's a, a head of an organization or a leader of a, a, a business in this country. Uh, and each of us can do something. And this is one of those cases where, while what we may individually do may not be uh, enormous, but the truth is it adds up when millions of us are doing it. Uh, and this is a place where climate citizenship is really critical in the way that we can operate. And it's an opportunity that is available to all of us, regardless of what our resources are, regardless of what our talents are, regardless of uh, what we believe uh, uh, kind of thing. We can make a difference. And this is certainly not a time for us to sit around with hand-rigging. This is a time for action. Help me thank our panelists.